The attitudes of the parents towards authority are repeated in the next generation by their children. Sparing Saul's life a second time. And rituals of the foot. All of this and more coming up next on Quick Study Bible Discovery TV. Stay with us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Bible Discovery TV. Thank you for joining us today. We are going through the Bible chronologically. So what that means is today we are studying 1 Samuel chapter 14 to 16 in the historical literature of the Bible. Now we're going to focus specifically on 1 Samuel 14, 1 to 13. This is interesting because one of the things we learn is that the attitudes of the fathers towards authority are repeated in the children unless the Lord steps in. A very scary and troubling thought. And uh, also Corey is here with Bible History and Archaeology. Corey. Today we are going to be taking a look at the ancient site of Gilgal and what archaeology has recently uncovered about it. Mentioned a lot actually in the passages that we're in. Okay Janice, mm -hmm. do you know? Do you know what items were taken from Saul as he slept to prove to him that David was not trying to kill him? All right, that and more coming up. Stay there as we continue. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 15 sees King Saul being decommissioned by the prophet Samuel. Now, he, of course, continues being king for many years after this, but the Bible says that the Spirit of God is lifted off of Saul, and in the very next chapter, we see the anointing of David as king later. Right now, we're going to take a look at the place where this decommissioning happened. It's called Gilgal. Entrance into the Promised Land, recorded in the book of Joshua, was marked by a miraculous stopping of the Jordan River, after which Israel took 12 stones from the river and set them up at their chosen campground. In Joshua 5, the name of that first campsite in Israel is given, Gilgal. The presence and influence of this Gilgal campsite continued through the time period of the judges and kings not as a city or an established settlement, but more as a place of gathering. First, it was used as a military base camp and center of organization by Joshua. A few generations later, it was used for the coronation of Israel's first king, Saul, and then again as a place of his ultimate failure and rejection as king in 1 Samuel 15. After King Solomon built a central temple of worship in Jerusalem, usage of sites like Gilgal for religious services was supposed to stop. But the writings of the prophets inform us that it was still used. Gilgal became a place of idolatry. Archaeology has recently shed light on the previously unknown location of Gilgal. If Gilgal wasn't a city or even a permanent settlement, but was regularly used, what did it look like? Beside the Jordan River lies an ancient stone enclosure that was built to look like the outline of a foot. It dates from the time period of Joshua, is in the right location, and was used for occasional religious gatherings. At first, the wall built to trace the outline of a foot in the countryside was confusing. But actually, it might help explain Israel's religious language. God had told the Israelites that he would give them every place the sole of your foot treads. Later, Gilgal was used for holding feasts and festivals. The Hebrew word for foot can also be used to mean feasts or festivals. 
The Israelites may have been taking God's command quite literally by building up their footprints in the promised land. Ancient Gilgal, uh, the perimeter of it being built as a, a large footprint actually makes a lot of sense. Now, there are uh, five other sites that archaeologists have uncovered dating from the time period of Joshua and the conquest that are also uh, these very large feet. Now, interestingly, one of them is built uh, in the Mount Ebal complex, which if you'll, if you'll remember, uh, that is the second place where Joshua actually built something. He built an altar to the Lord to renew the covenant. So this really ties in together what we know from the Bible about the imagery of the foot that God used uh, to talk to the Israelites, and it also ties in some of their religious language as well. Very good, Corey. Excellent work. And by the way, I want to remind you that Corey has an article in the Discovery Letter, which comes every month for Discovery members. Now, I want to remind you that you can get a hold of your power guide each and every month if you become a regular giver. And by giving an uh, offering in any amount, here is our address. And if you would like to write and get your Bible guide sent to you every single month, we call it the Power Guide, then send to, in the United States, P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Also, remember, you can call for this commentary exclusive with Quick Study at 724-733-8336 or in Canada, 519-940-8338. You can get it online as well at BibleDiscoveryTV.com and we'll talk more about this coming up. Let's study on. It's time to explore the superheroes of the Bible. Now, the real character of a man is best revealed in his marriage and in his children. Paul the Apostle teaches Timothy that the best way to spot a good spiritual leader is to observe his family. If a man has respect from his children and from his wife, then the man is worthy of pastoral respect, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we continue tracking the life and the times of Israel's first king. Jonathan is the son of Saul, but it appears there is not much respect from the son of Saul for his father. Jonathan often conducts his own exercises outside his father's command. He is zealous for God's people more so than even the king of Israel himself. But there is little concern for honoring the authority of his father, the king. First Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 through 13. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about six hundred men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sine. The front of one faced northward opposite Michmash, and the other southward opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor-bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, 
wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor-bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor-bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, his armor-bearer killed them. 1 Samuel 14, 1 through 13. Thank you for staying with us. Rod Hembry here. This is Bible Discovery Quick Study Television. And over the course of the next few days, we are going to study two different leaders. One of them is good and right and anointed by God, and the other is not. During this time, we're also going to read the Psalms because the Psalms that we're going to read were written during the time in which David was running from the evil King Saul. And so today, as we begin our discussion, it's important for us to realize the truth about leadership because many people will become leaders of their community. And even if you're not a leader of your community, you're called by God to lead in your relationships. So with that in mind, let's take a look at 1 Samuel, the historical books of the Bible, and look at the overview. Now, the overview, I call this strong respect. And this is a reading assignment of 1 Samuel chapter 14 to 16. What's interesting about this, as we focus on 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 to 13, three points out of the four in the power guide, is we are going to look at the son of the king called King Saul. Now, King Saul was not a good king. He had a high opinion of himself. He had an exaggerated need for approval. He was very insecure. At the same time, he was very careless with the things of God. So he did not gain the respect even of his own children. And Jonathan will give us that example. Let's begin with here the scripture as we look at 1 Samuel 14, 1 to 3. And the Bible says, Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. Now look at this line. But he did not tell his father. And so verse 2 tells us, And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gabeah under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men, Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, and the Lord's priest of Shiloh. He was wearing the ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Now, before we get to the first point, I want to highlight your attention to something absolutely amazing. Most of us today, when we look at leadership in which we follow, specifically in the church I'm talking about, we look at the giftings or perhaps the fruit of the Spirit, or I should say the gifts of the Spirit. So we see somebody who's doing great healings and we say, wow, God is a great gifted leader there. Or we see someone who's giving great dramatic prophecies and we say, wow, what a leader that is. God is leading through that prophet. But beloved, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that leadership, God's leadership, is not judged by their giftings or even their human abilities. It is judged, real leadership is judged by their character among their family. And one of the prerequisites for a good pastor is that his children must respect him. Here we see that this is not the case with King Saul. Jonathan does not even respect his father enough to actually tell him what's going on. He launches his own campaigns. Now he learned that behavior from his own father. And so here's the point. As we look at the PowerPoint, it's actually the attitudes of the father towards God's authority will be reflected in the attitudes of the son to the father's authority. Interesting. And so, beloved, children do not do what you tell them. Children do what you do. And whatever attitude that you as a father or a mother have towards God, that is going to be inculcated into your children. 
And you'll see it bear out later on. That's what's happening. Let's go back to the scripture. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 4, it says, Between the passes which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, well, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other. But the name of the one was Bozes, and the other the name was Sina. Now the front faced, uh, the front of one faced inward, or northward, I should say, opposite of Michmash, and the other one southward opposite of Gabeah. And then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, that is the Gentiles. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Now, Jonathan had faith. Here's the next point. You see, young men will be motivated by real faith. Even if their fathers are not motivated by faith, young men are looking for powerful purpose. And I want to tell you something. If you want to get a hold of the next generation, then be a man of faith, be a father of faith, be a person of faith, because the next generation is looking for a purpose and a reason bigger than themselves and bigger than this world to follow. Let's carry on to the next passage. As we read on in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 7, it says, now look at the arm bearer who's standing behind Jonathan. So in this case, Jonathan is leading his arm bearer. And so his arm bearer said to him, well, you know what, Jonathan, I'm good for it, man. Do all that is in your heart. Go then. And here I am. I am with you according to your heart. Isn't that amazing? And so here we have the next point, uh, the strong point. Young men will make powerful leaders when they are motivated by real faith in God and not the fake faith of the church culture. And beloved, may I challenge you today that there is real faith in God, which has more to do with obedience. It has more to do with living the word of God. It has more to do with character change. And then there is the fake faith of the church culture, which is all about the church culture, or even perhaps signs and wonders. You see, signs and wonders can be mimicked, and it's very dramatic. But God is much more than dramatic, beloved. God is all powerful. And when he changes a person from the inside out, young men and women see that and they recognize real faith and real authority when they see it. When they see their parents not uh, bending and moving to every whim of our culture, but when, they, when the parents stand firm in the faith of God and recognize the gospel of Jesus Christ for what it is. of 1st Samuel is named after its prominent character, Samuel, the priest, the prophet, and really some call him the last judge of Israel. I wouldn't go that far, but he definitely is a priest and a prophet. Now, 1st Chronicles 29 tells us that Samuel actually wrote much of what is found in the book of 1st Samuel. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at the city that Samuel called his hometown. The ancient city of Rama is located five miles north of Jerusalem in a relatively central location. Because of this important location, it shows up in the biblical narrative. Rama is the city from which the famous female judge of Israel, Deborah, leads the people. And it is also the home of the final judge of Israel, Samuel. In 1 Kings 15 and 2 Chronicles 16, the city of Rama is used as a declaration of war by the king of the northern kingdom against the king of the southern kingdom. Ramah was located in the land belonging to the tribe of Benjamin, right on the border between the two kingdoms. It was strategically placed just to the east of a main road connecting the two kingdoms. It was on a trade route, a travel route. The king of the north began to build up and fortify Rama. He was making it into a strong outpost so that he could effectively control entry and exit into both kingdoms. He was reinvigorating all of the old hostilities between the kingdoms, confident in his rule, confident in his allies. His plan, however, does not come to completion, and Rama is brought back to its original state, but controversy at Ramah was not over. Years later, during the lifetime of the prophet Jeremiah, 
Rama would be used as a type of prison camp by the Babylonian army. Having just destroyed what was left of the southern kingdom of Judah, they use Rama as a sorting center for the captive Israelites. The prisoners are cataloged and sent into exile. Quick Study and Bible Discovery TV is supported by our Discovery Partners. Discovery Partners are faithful viewers who generously give every month to keep this program alive and on the air. We have a very unique and special offer for you right now. A one-hour Bible Investigators DVD called The Prophets and the Messiah. We explore what prophecy really is according to the Bible and how Jesus Christ was prophesied hundreds of times, hundreds of years before His birth, death, and resurrection. This shocking and compelling video program features Rod, Janice, and Corey Hembry and is yours for a special donation this month of $25 or more. We need your help to continue broadcasting Quick Study each and every day. If you have never responded before, we need you now. Become a Discovery Partner today. When you write or call, ask for the DVD video, The Prophets and the Messiah. Post Office Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or Post Office Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. In Canada, call 519-940-8338. Or in the U.S., 724-733-8336. Rod Hember here along with Jan. Thank you for staying with us as we continue to go through the Bible. I want to mention that next time on the Quick Study Television program, we are going to be focused as we discover the Bible together in 1 Samuel chapter 17 to 18. Now what we learn about leadership is this. Good leadership is recognized by good moral virtue, not by gifting, which is totally out of character in today's world. Today's world, we're impressed with performance and giftings and but actually, God sees good leadership as moral virtue. Very interesting. All right, so we have, uh, do you know? Yes. Do you know what items were taken from Saul as he slept to prove to him that David was not trying to kill him? Corey? Yes, I believe the answer is uh, uh, a spear, his spear that he had put beside his head while he was sleeping, and also a jug. Spear and a jug. Final answer. <laughs> yep. Let's take a look at it. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 11. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, said David. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. This was David speaking to Abishai. And it was interesting because David did not touch Saul because he had a respect for God mm -hmm. and realized that even though the leadership was corrupt, it was God's responsibility mm -hmm to answer his prayer, and all during the time that David was running away from Saul. Because we Saul have, was trying to kill him. Right, and we have such, all these Psalms, yes. amazing Psalms mm -hmm. that come forth. Mm -hmm. And so we're enjoying going through the Bible. Now we're going to get the benefit in just a few days of going through the Bible chronologically. Because at the time David is running away, we start to investigate the Psalms that were written in this same That's time. Right. And so this is going to be very interesting. I want to remind you as well that we hear you. And you can respond to us on Twitter. And our Twitter account, it's at Rod, capital R-O-D, or capital R, and then O-D underscore capital T-B, at Rod. And we'll read your comments here. And also any questions you have will be for our new program, which we're coming up with called What Does It Say About the Bible, hosted by Rachel McDonald and myself. It's going to be a very interesting program. But I also, Janice, want to talk to the folks about our power guide. Now, when I say power guide, what am I talking about? You're talking about a print companion that, that you actually write every month. You pour so much of yourself into that. I, I see you study so much, and you're so dedicated to that because you love the Word of God. And uh, it's about a 30 two page booklet that goes along with this program. It gives you the readings, it gives you the points that Rod will talk about in this program, minus one. You get an extra one in each of the monthly guides. And so we want to make it available to you. It's from my heart to you as we learn the Bible together and go through the Bible. Now, if you give an offering in any amount, that keeps us 
here. I need your help to stay here. Need your help to keep the lights on, the cameras rolling. Need your help to stay teaching the Word of God each and every day right here. So when you give in any amount, that's how you help us. Here's how you can do so by writing to us at P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, we need to hear from our partners on Daystar, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Also, you can call us at 724-733-8336 in the United States. Need to hear from our viewers on Cornerstone or 519-940-8338. You can also get a hold of us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Intercessors, here is today's call to prayer. God's young men are ready and waiting to rise up. When they see God's men living God's way, they will be inspired to follow. Too long God's men have been chasing their own dreams instead of pursuing God's vision. Obedience in lifestyle, faithfulness to marriage and family, and commitment to God's kingdom is what our young men need to see now. There is great strength for the church when the young men see us to follow God with all our hearts, mind, and strength. So with that we pray, Lord, teach me to be a faithful man of God. In our Strength in Your Mind segment today, I have a great question for you. Where does the Bible warn men who are lazy in the faith. Did you know you could be lazy in the faith? Absolutely. Lazy in the faith means when all you're worried about is your experience. It's all about the drama of your experience with a worship service or whatever. But when we work, study to show ourselves approved, the workman that needeth not be ashamed in the Word of God, when we realize that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, then of course we are able to determine truth. Now, beloved, today I want to encourage you that the Word of God says Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that you and I could be saved, so that we could read the Word differently. We could read the Word when we are in total righteousness with Him through the blood of Christ. So I want to encourage you today, if you really want to understand the Bible, then from my family to yours, from the crew here to you, come to Jesus today, give your heart to Him, trust Him, and He will help you understand this amazing Word of God. The Quick Study Power Guide is a print companion to this program and its daily commentary. Write for yours or call 519-940-8338 and receive yours automatically every month. Call now and get your Power Guide.